All right, hey folks, uh, here's your lecture on the phosphorus cycle and the hydrologic cycle. Um, I'm just kind of looping you in. We already did talk about the phosphorus cycle a little bit. I just wanted to make sure that you understood that um, phosphorus is going to be a driving force of uh, growth in waterways just because so little um, so little nutrients get in there in the first place. So. Uh, just be aware if any phosphorus or honestly any nitrogen too runs into a waterway here it's boy that algae is going to growth is going to go nuts um okay so we already um looked at that and we talked about how little fresh water there is on this planet and then we started um filling in these on i'm sorry that the uh, stuff got kind of out of order um, but on page 23 is where these uh, there's three blank columns. Um, you just need to kind of, um, you are going to need to memorize these percentages at some point. So um, understand that the majority of the world's water is salt, which means it's basically beyond our ability to use, except um, under circumstances that actually require a lot of funding. You can take salt out of water, but uh, number one, it costs a lot of money. Number two, it takes a lot of fuel. And then number three, that's it serves a different purpose. It's where it is for a reason. Um, we need to learn to live within the means that we have of this fresh water up here. It's not important for you to know the saline groundwater and saline lakes. Just know that that's like right around 1%. You can just call that other. It's more important for you to know the differentiation between the percentages for oceans and fresh water. Um, and remember, this is a video. You can pause whenever you like. Um, okay, so now you have this little tiny bit right here, this 2.5%. If you expand it, two-thirds of that 2.5% is um, glaciers and ice caps. So basically, two-thirds of the world's fresh water is locked away in ice. Um, well, why don't we melt it? Well, uh, it's where it is for a reason. Um, it has a high albedo, a high reflectivity. It reflects some of the sun's rays uh, back. And so uh, it means that we're not as warm as we're supposed to be. So it's part of what makes life possible on this planet. So the ice is where it is for a reason. Um, so then a third is fresh liquid water, but then most of that is groundwater and very little of it is surface and fresh water. Um, the next slide, we're going to talk about exactly how much of this is accessible. Uh, means can we get to it? Um, a lot of the groundwater is too deep and kind of too diffuse. It's not concentrated enough for us to get to. Um, so here you can see um, of this surface, another freshwater. Um, uh, you know, most of that again is locked in, of, in ice and snow. So really the majority of the freshwater we have available to us isn't really available to us. And um, then you have that much in lakes, um, rivers, we can get to the rest of the stuff is not really available to us. So the, the, the moral of the story here is we do not have a lot of fresh water at our disposal. So um, the things that we're going to talk about in this class, keep coming back to this particular chart and say to yourself, self, well, maybe we need to not be doing it like that anymore. Um, I'm not suggesting that we stop all, you know, use of environmental resources. We, we need to live to here too. But there are definitely ways that we can do a better job. Um, okay, so only about 0.02% of the Earth's water supply is available to us as a liquid fresh water. That is not something that was will be on the exam, but it is something to keep in mind um, moving forward when we talk about human impacts on, on water supplies. Um, this is not something that we are going to discuss. Um, this is a little bit more political than we need to get. Um, so on page 23 where it says, here's where the post-apocalyptic water wars will be fought, you can just X that out. We do not need it. Um, okay, so here's the water cycle. We're bouncing back to page 22 because of my amazing organizational skills. Um, you need to know where all the water is or what it's called and then understand the names. Okay, so you have condensation. That's where it turns into a cloud. Precipitation is rain. Um, when the water goes from, you know, the liquid into the ground, that's called infiltration. When it pops back out of the, the soil into a water supply again, it's called discharge. 
Um, you need to know where the main reserves of this is. It's obviously the ocean for fresh water. It's, it's ice, um, you know, evaporation, transpiration, runoff. This is something we're going to become obsessed with. Water is a universal dissolver. You may want to write that down somewhere because that basically means anywhere that that stuff runs, it picks up whatever it is that it goes over. So if it goes over an oil spill, it's going to take some oil with it. If it goes over a pesticide, it's going to take some pesticide with it. Um, and so on and so on and so on. So, um, and then when it infiltrates into the ground, um, it may take some of those uh, toxins with it. All right, so um, this is uh, the chart on page 22. I'm just gonna run through this really quick. You are welcome to stop whenever you need to. So um, transfer processes, sorry, this is not lining up very well. Um, uh, words that indicate change. Uh, infiltration, runoff, plant uptake, transpiration, um, seepage, that's just, um, whoop, sorry, that is just going into the ground kind of slow. I don't know that it's on here. Yeah. Well, seepage actually is coming out. Um, that's not really a word that we use. Infiltration for sure. Um, not in the picture. Consumption that's drinking. And then percolation um, is is another word for um, uh, going into the ground, basically. Okay. Phase changes. You need to know when stuff is a solid, a liquid, or a gas. Snow melt, solid to liquid. Evaporation, liquid to gas. Sublimation from solid to a gas that very rarely happens here on, on the planet, um, unless you're buying dry ice at Publix. Um, freezing, condensation, fog drip. That's from a gas to a liquid. Um, climate change effects. Again, sorry, this doesn't fit into there. Um, uh, as it gets warmer, uh, in some places, precipitation will increase. In some places, it will decrease, which means some places will have drought. Some places will have flooding. We'll miss which place is which. We'll, we'll get to it. Um, sea level rise, guys, sea level rise does not, does not, does not come from glaciers melting for the most part. Um, it comes from, uh, because, okay, here's why. Um, sea ice, when it melts, it actually ends up taking less space and that would be responsible for sea levels dropping. Um, the, the ice that melts that does impact sea level um, rise is going to be the land ice. Sea ice, not so much land ice for sure. Um, there are other reasons for um, sea levels rising that we will get to in a another unit. Um, loss of habitats, um, you know, like polar bears, they're, they're out on the ice. Um, freshwater sources, um, when glaciers melt next to bodies of salt water, it basically becomes salt water. And then groundwater depletion. Um, all of those places underground where water um, uh, kind of not builds up but kind of accumulates through natural means um, you're gonna learn the name for that here in a minute uh, we have a tendency to basically poke a straw into the ground and suck the water out and um, we do that oftentimes faster than it replenishes itself through rain so um, that source of water is uh, starting to dwindle I mean we have the same amount of water on this planet it's just not where we need it right now um, uh, other human effects, again, remember, uh, universal solvent. So uh, whatever it is, it runs across, it picks up everything from um, uh, chemicals, toxic metals, endocrine disruptors. You don't know what that is yet, but go ahead and write that down. Um, uh, the endocrine system is basically your, your hormones. Um, endo endocrine disruptors kind of um, mess with those um, chemicals that are basically signals in your body. Um, eutrophication, that comes from excess nutrients, so if it, run across, it runs across fertilizer, takes it with it, and then causes an excess of plant growth in places where it's not supposed to, that's not supposed to be happening. And then thermal pollution, if water gets too warm, um, fish are kind of delicate, and that's beyond um, what's called their range of tolerance, the thickness that they can tolerate without dying, um, and then they did, and that's bad. Um, you know, Biggest reservoirs, obviously, lakes or oceans are the largest. Um, biota, that means living things, also contain some life. So anyway, go ahead and get that down and think about it. Okay, so here's some important water vocab. If you'll turn to page 23, um, the again, the alignment got all messed up. That's on me. Uh, it says important water terms, and then there's a blank, and then it says precipitation il infiltrates the ground and is stored in store is stored in soil and rock. And then it has, how does climate change affect the water cycle? 
that's not supposed to be there. That's supposed to be before important water terms. So just kind of draw yourself an arrow because the rest of the important water terms are on page 24. So the top part of 23 and then 24. Um, okay, good. So take a second with a pencil or um, a pen that you can always X out and then know what you got wrong. Attempt to fill these out. So pause this for a second and give it a try. All right, let's go over the answers. Um, groundwater is precipitation that infiltrates the ground and is stored in soil and rock. Um, you're going to see some terms there um, that I'm trying to think if I'm going to hold you responsible for that right now. Probably you can you can learn the water table. Um, water table is the level at which you start finding water. Um, and it's at different levels in different places. In some places, it is right up against the bottom of the soil. Like you can just dig for a second and find water. In other places, you can dig for a mile before you can actually hit water, um, which means that uh, when you're trying to find water in some places for agriculture especially, it's really hard. Uh, humans can also affect the water table. So if you take out more water, from groundwater sources then um, replenishes, then that means that um, you uh, have to keep digging to find it. So uh, you, know, you draw yourself a little picture somewhere, unsaturated zone, water table. Um, this says the groundwater zone. It's also called the saturated uh, zone. There's no one term for it, so that would mean that you would probably see it as a picture on the exam, but definitely no what the water table is. That's the interface between where there is water um, and where there is not. Um, surface runoff, water, water that doesn't sink into the ground or evaporates. This is the stuff that basically carries one chemi chemicals from one place to another. Um, a watershed or drainage basin. This is, has its own topic devoted to it later on, but just kind of know what it is right now. It's all of the um, it's all of the highest points in a given area. So since gravity drives water flow, um, it then runs from the, the highest area to the lowest. And we in environmental science are concerned about that because again, water is a universal solvent and anywhere that water runs, it's gonna pick stuff up and eventually take it to the rivers that are at the, the bottom of all of those slopes. Um, I know there's not currently space in the notes here right now. You can make some space um, moving forward. I'll make sure that these notes are better aligned to um, what it is that you need to know. So um, underground, uh, okay, so these are aquifers. A couple of things of note here. Um, uh, basically, they're, they're specifically a porous, usually they're porous layers of sand, gravel, or, or bedrock. Um, it, it's where water accumulates. Um, we have a big aquifer under us here. In Florida, this is where we get a lot of our water. Um, you need to know the difference between an unconfined aquifer and a confined aquifer. The only difference is um, where these things can recharge. An unconfined aquifer basically, you know, it rains here, it gets into the aquifer. It rains here, it gets into the aquifer. No big deal. This one down here is a confined aquifer. It is only in this little area right here that can it can fill up. So good news, bad news. Good news is not a lot of pollution gets in. Bad news is not a lot of water gets in either. So if this particular aquifer is overdrafted, um, which means more water is taken out than actually goes in, this is where you start to see water levels um, decrease. Um, the water table, like I said, the, the level below which the ground is saturated with water, different it's at different levels in different places. Um, again, unconfined and confined. Um, aquifers, we already kind of went over that. Um, the, the confining parts are usually um, just bedrock. Um, and uh, that we'll get to it in a second, but that, that straw that we poke in there like it's a Capri Sun is, um, it's basically called a well. Um, here we go, an artisan well. Um, uh, it pushes water up without a pump. Um, that just means that there's enough water in there with enough pressure. It's like if a toddler is holding a Capri Sun and they're kind of pinching it in their fists so that when they drive that straw in the Capri Sun, uh, the juice kind of spurts everywhere. This is the same idea. Now, the implication should be at some point it stops spurting, and that's absolutely true. If you pull out more 
um, then is re replenished, at some point the pressure is going to um, decrease and you're going to have to actually apply some sort of mechanical force to get it to come out. Um, okay, so this part is the how does climate change affect the water cycle. Um, again, more or less precipitation. So you either have flooding or drought. We'll talk about the specifics of that later. Um, increased irrigation and uptake required. Um, and then also you have the, because you're going to have increased evaporation in some places, you're going to have a loss of groundwater and depleted aquifers. Um, this is not something I'm going to test you on right now, but just uh, climate change comes at the very end for us in this class. Uh, just be aware that it basically affects everything. It's just one more thing for us to be concerned with. It, it actually impacts our ability to access fresh water. Now with this, um, you can use this to kind of test yourself to see where, um, if you can name different processes and what's going on here. Um, I think there are a couple of just like extra arrows. Um, you can make this make sense for yourself. I just thought it was cute. Um, human impacts in the hydrologic cycle are really, it's kind of the same story over and over again. We're using more than, it, than can be replenished and we're polluting a lot of what we've got. So um, pollution won't be enough of an answer come exam day, but that's enough for right now. When I talk, when I say pollution, I mean everything from pesticides to um, oil spills to uh, plastic to garbage to basically anything you can think of that gets into the water, heavy metals. So yeah, um, the rest of the slide deck that's up is kind of extra stuff. You can look at it or not. Sometimes it helps to look at different versions of something. Um, but yeah, definitely be able to trace water as it moves through all of the parts of the cycle. So that is the end of your lecture.